Hi, this is Henning Stahlberg. Today is October 16, 2017. I want to show you how focus can be used to process um, images, plain images, not movies or stacks or something, just plain images containing 2D crystals. So I have here in this central window a collection of a few files. Um, I'm working in a folder which is called data proteins uh, slash 2D crystals, which is an example folder, and in here there's just one folder called TIFF. Um, you can call it whatever you want, you can place it also elsewhere. And in this here I have a few um, MRC images. Um, if I go into one of these um, with clip info, for example, um, this shows us that these are 3800 pixels in size, only one frame, um, and there's 1.34 angstroms per pixel. This is the MRC header that I'm looking at with the clip command. Um, so those are essentially 4K images from a K2 image. There's also two smaller images, I think. Um, can I look into this? I'm not sure. Yes, I can. So that's a 2K image. Um, I think the pixel size is not correct in this TIFF header, but it's a 2K image. And the other file is a 4K image with the wrong pixel size. And this is uh, mode byte, and the previous ones were mode byte, and before that was mode floating point. Okay. So this is all we have at the moment, just these files. <coughs> I'm now calling focus, I'm doing this somewhere else, or just usually what I do is I do a git pull to update my local software to whatever is on the GitHub right now, and then I run build all, um, which compiles um, the current source code, which I just pulled from GitHub with git pull, so that I have the latest version of the program and the scripts and the MRC package and everything that is included. Um, and then I launch focus um, from anywhere. Um, so, and now I want to create a new project. And for this project, I add a new project here and I navigate to this path where um, I want to work, and this was the 2D crystal folder with the TIFF files in there, but we are not using them, we are just working here. And this is a new project, I initialize it from the master, it's a 2D electron crystallography project, and I call this 2D test, or whatever, something. This is a demonstration, and then focus launches. I'm working here on a Ubuntu Linux machine, which is nice and fast and offers uh, NVIDIA GPUs. Um, but I'm recording the screen on a Macintosh and I'm connecting to the Ubuntu machine from the Macintosh via TeamViewer. Um, so I can record this 4K screen that I'm displaying here. Um, and at the right end of this screen I have a window running top here. Um, so we can see there's TeamViewer running but not much else. And down here we can see what the two graphics cards are doing. At the moment they're not doing much to GeForce 1080. And down here is the 48 cores of this very nice machine with a lot of RAM. 256 gigabyte of RAM or so. So when we launch Focus we end up in this um, library view and there's nothing at the moment because there's no files uh, imported. Um, so you want to import them. And I go to the import section now. Um, and we have to tell here, top left, where we get these proteins from. And they should actually stay right here, because this is where our TIFF folder is. Um, so we are importing now from the same folder where we will work on. Usually you wouldn't do this, but for now we do it. And these are 2D images that were in the subfolder TIFF. Um, and these are already game corrected, so we do not need any of this here. This only applies for movies. 
dark subtracted or gain corrected movies so we don't need this now right now we are just dealing only with this one the files and if I rescan this folder focus finds all kinds of 2d images but there are no aligned stacks or raw stacks you would use these in other settings um, these are the file names that um, 2dx or focus found this is a 2dx scripts running here and these are the folder locations that these will be imported into. They will all go into auto and then a folder with a number. And we can already now define some scripts that we want to run on them, but I don't do this now. Um, and these file names here, they, they could contain information, but I'm not doing this now. So well, maybe I do it. So the separation in the file name is an underscore and my first f field there is a specimen name and, and everything else you can ignore. Um, just to see if we get this this file name memorized somewhere. So if I import this now, they are imported. And this is very quick because they are just copied over and there's no scripts running on them. So this is all done now. There's a few more to come. So now they are imported. <coughs> we left them in this TIFF folder, so they are still present. And if you now look at the library, there's our auto folder here, which I can open. And the specimen name is now the first field. The first field that we had here until the, the um, underscore, underline here was just the date when this was recorded or for this one year it would be the entire image name. So we are in the library and there are all these columns here they contain nothing and many of them we will not need so I will just go into any of them by double clicking and if I double click this I open in the process tab this one image and here I have these images uh, these scripts that we can run on this. This is a 2D image. So what we need to run first is this import 2D image, um, <coughs> which I just run here with this run button. And if I do so, um, this progress bar goes from left to right, and all kinds of things are done with this image, which you can see if you double click this script then it opens and this is the C shell script template where the title of the script is defined here and the sort order under which it appears in this list is given then and then here is the set of parameters that will show up here so that we can edit them and underneath here is the parameters that are then um, prepared when we would press the play button this play button if you would press that then these numbers here that are in this database would be filled in into these these lines here so that these variables are accessible for the remainder of the script and the remainder of the script is then down here. Um, so right now this ran and it has <coughs> listed here the raw image and this was a 4K image with one frame only and the min and max were um, between minus 400 and plus 400. This was a floating point image, mode 2. And after rescaling it, it's still the same here. And there is a Fourier transform computed also for this thing. Um, if we switch this back to the preview, we have here the raw image and the slightly histogram adjusted probably also image and then the Fourier transform. Um, the <coughs> some parameters here were set CS and kilovolt and magnification and so they were set from default values. Um, some of the default values are accessible here in the settings tab for example the microscope default values and kilovolts are here um, if there's nothing known about these images, then it uses what is here as preferences set for the microscope you have. But um, if you have an old data set from lots of images that were recorded with a different 
machine. One could also go now and adjust this manually here. For example, if we say this was a 2.0 millimeter CS and a 200 kilovolt microscope, you could adjust it here and then save this as default value um, for future files to import by clicking, clicking this button. So if I would press yes here, then the default definitions for all the parameters that we just would have adjusted, which is not only CS and kilovolt, but everything else also, would be saved as a default. Um, this would not apply for the images that we have already imported, but if I would have another many images not yet imported, then upon importing they would get these values that we would have manually defined, but I'm not doing this here. And actually this came from a 2.7 CS microscope and was a 300 kilovolt machine. It was a Titan Cryos. Um, <coughs> so if I now want to process this 2D crystal images, we have to skip the alignment section because this is for movies. And we have to skip the process section, which is um, also for single particle things. I think these scripts work, but for 2D crystals, it's more interesting to run these 2D crystal scripts here, which are the former 2DX scripts. And I start with the first one, which is the initialization of all kinds of parameters. Um, which are shown here on the top. Um, so these parameters, some of them are interesting as default parameters. They are computed based on um, the image size and pixel size and some other things. Um, but many other values are just reset to zero. Um, the image site length, for example, is not yet known as a script. We'll put number here or we'll put length there. There's a magnification now, <coughs> um, which is correct, but init files and parameters is the next script we need to run. This script um, <coughs> calculates, for example, um, this script, for example, calculates the image site length just from the header of the image so that's that's now filled in here and it also calculates the magnification um, so it calculates the magnification from the pixel size here we have to define the pixel size and then the hardware pixel size uh, of the camera in micrometers and this was a k2 with five micrometers and these two numbers then are calculated back to a magnification that would correspond to that. If you would have used a Tietz camera with 14 micrometer pixel size and run this, then, but you are sure about the pixel size in angst terms on your image, then it would come up with a different magnification. So the, the script would um, correct these numbers here. Um, there we have access to the raw image and the non-masked image. There's nothing really interesting. The next um, script calculates the Fourier transform of the image, which is this one here, and <coughs> also the downsampled Fourier transform, um, which are shown here on the right. Yeah, we can look at this later. So here's the Fourier transform. If I open this, uh, it opens full screen. This is a 2D crystal. There's diffraction spots. This is actually a nice one. There's a ton ring. Um, this is a very nice one. There's more than one lettuce. This is very confusing here. Um, on the right mouse click, we have all kinds of options now for 2D crystals. For example, we can adjust with B, make it brighter, or with N, like night, make the Fourier transform darker. Um, we can zoom in or out with comma and dot, um, and so on. There's lots of options. Um, T displays the tilt axis once we have this in the raw image, and shift T would display this for the final map. we we'll come to this later. With escape, we can leave this full screen browser. 
So the next script computes the defocus and tilt in this image. And um, I do not want to record or calculate the tilt geometry right now based on a defocus gradient, but just the defocus. And for speed reasons, since we run on an Ubuntu machine, I can run GCTF, that's faster. Um, Kai Zhang's program that's amazingly fast, that produces um, <coughs> ton ring fits. Um, typically, CTF fitting programs have problems with 2D crystals. If these 2D crystal spots in negative stain, for example, are really strong, then they are easily mistaken for a ton ring, for a white ton ring. But in this image, it worked. Um, so the left is a simulation and the right is from the data. This looks correct. Um, and if I would use CTF find, the same would hopefully come out, but this runs much longer. So the, here is CTF find. It runs now on uh, 31 cores with hyperthreading. Um, the output of these programs shows up here. You can always switch the verbosity to the highest and then I see more. What runs here is a modified version of CTF find 3 from Nico Grigoriev. CTF find um, was modified here so that it uh, takes one important additional parameter, which is here in the fifth um, parameter card. Um, and if this is set to 1, then CTF find would skip astigmatism determination and only adjust in a one-dimensional search the ton rings. And we do this to look for defocus gradients on 7x7 seven seven tiles across the image. And then CTF find 3 becomes very fast. If it's only doing a one-dimensional search, um, assuming that the astigmatism for every tile is the same. But here right now I'm running this with a zero, so uh, meaning that I do not search for I do search for astigmatism. Um, and if you modify a program by somebody else, then usually we have edit 2dx or focus or something before the name. But it's still 99% is Nico Gigoyev's Fortran program here. Um, parameters are shown here. Um, for example, the defocus is 9,000 angstroms in one direction and 10,000 angstroms in the other direction with an angle of 75 degrees for the first axis towards the x-axis. That's still the GCTF values. Oh no, CTF find is also done. And these values are now from uh, CTF find. Yeah can always hover the mouse over these variables and then see some instructions. Um, yeah. So let me verify if this is correct by just displaying the ton rings here. With N I make this n darker and with C I can display the ton rings here. Let us see and this looks good. I can with C click this on and off. This looks good. Otherwise, I could move um, the ton rings with um, cursor up and down or um, page up and down on the keyboard or I can modify these values here um, by hand if I want to. And these lines are true um, astigmatism. So these are zero crossings of the simulated CTF. If I set the astigmatism, for example, to something very extreme then it becomes elliptic, and then later on these become hyperboles, as astigmatism should be. So, let me see if this works. Yeah. Um, so, and if you would click on accept, then these values are taken over into the database, but I just click on reload to have the original values back, because they looked nice. Um, <coughs> The next thing would be the lattice determination. And this is something that usually with the first image you want to process, it fails. And what we do here, let me just switch on that we see all the temporary files here. Keep large temporary files and then I run this again and we see a bit more. So what this does is following um, ideas of Richard Henderson and Sriram Subramaniam that were in electron diffraction processing 
used. So the first thing is um, the image is edge tapered so that the edge is going towards equal gray along all edges and that eliminates from the Fourier transform the cross wire from the middle. And then we have a power spectrum and this is now only the center of the power spectrum. And this is band pass filtered, so high pass and low pass filtered to eliminate too strong contrast and also the center um, there's some search pattern that tries to eliminate any artifacts and continued streaks that are still in the middle and also the rest of the cross wire is eliminated. And the next thing would be then to further band pass filtering this and now these peaks get stronger and then this is masked again so the outside is still masked. So and in this image now this is still similar to the original power spectrum in this image a peak search looks for peaks and if I look at this here I guess we have something on only one half because it's Friedel symmetric left and right so on one half they have probably like 50 peaks or so these peaks that we can see by eye and this 50 is an important parameter that we have to adjust here and it's this parameter here the initial number of peaks these are global parameters, so I adjust them for all images. And I set this to 50. And so what happens then is that on all these 50 peak positions, let me just open this here. This is the image that we just looked at. On all these 50 positions, um, the peak is searched, and with Shift P, with Shift P, I can display these coordinates. So this is this Shift P. P, the view, the to view the peak list. Um, this is less than 50, so maybe it's on the entire Fourier transform. This was at 60 before. So the strongest peaks here are found. Some of them look really odd. I don't know why it would pick a peak there. Or maybe this is the wrong peak list. I can load a peak list here, load peak list, but I don't go into this. But the idea would be that um, it searches for the most important peaks here. Let's say it found all these very strong peaks. And then it makes a copy of this entire pattern and shifts it with this peak to the origin. So we have 50 copies of this pattern all centered on one of these peaks. And then these 50 copies are averaged. And by doing so, we obtain this origin shifted average power spectrum which is this one. And this one has now no missing uh, reflections anymore. If you have systematic absences in your lattice, this pattern would not have it. And this is now much more complete than before. And <coughs> we can, in this pattern now, search for um, peaks um, that would then be the full set of reflections. Um, and I think this is the this is now the peak P. No, it's also not. I don't know which button this is, but there's another peak list now in this pattern. And these positions of peaks are then used to find a lattice. So we start with a text file of x and y coordinates of peaks plus peak height from this pattern. And this pattern, this origin shifted average power spectrum, should show something that makes sense. So it should show a pattern where one could by hand click on the lattice. And I could do this by hand because I know my protein quite well in the meantime, so I know that probably here's one axis and here's the other axis, and then I can I can recognize here the first and second and third and fourth spot, and in the other direction there's the first and second and or maybe here, first and second and third and fourth spot. So this is doable by hand, and then hopefully the computer can do it. So then on this thing here, the computer was looking for a lettuce using the program get lettuce here. And get lettuce is a program written by Brian Gibson that um, guesses a lettuce based on these peaks that we just discussed by looking for different vectors between neighboring peaks and then looking for the most prominent difference vector that is the strongest one and the shortest one, and then looking for the second most prominent difference lattice vector that is orthogonal or linearly independent from the first one in a different direction, 
and also very strong and very short. And these two are then guessed as being the lattice vectors. And that usually works, um, but has a problem if you have um, too many overlapping lattices. And they only can only also can only find only one lattice. The alternative algorithm is find lattice, and that is a program that uh, needs to be told what the real space dimensions of your crystal are. So it needs to have precise values here for the real unit cell length. And I know that on these crystals here, the real unit cell is 134 by 134 angstroms with a 90 degree angle between them. Um, and if you know this, then you could use find lattice, and find lattice will search for the known lattice by creating um, a hypothetical test vector set and rotating it around in your image and try where it snaps in with these peaks. And that allows then to find more than one lattice. And it also allows to accommodate um, lattice distortions if your crystal was tilted in the microscope. So usually we start with cat lattice. If you don't know anything about the protein and if we know the real space dimensions, we continue with find lattice. So for the moment it was cat lattice. And now let's see what cat lattice would have done here. So if I click on this origin shifted power spectrum and now press on L, the key L is displaying the lattice here. Um, it shows a lattice, N to make it darker. This looks actually good. The first lattice is the red circle, the second one is the blue one. This looks like a reasonable lattice, so it found it. There is a second lattice register, um, which I get with S, and that is not yet existing. So the second lattice is not known. But this looks good. So um, this, I know that my crystal has a 90 degree angle, but this lattice here, what was just measured, does not look at all like a 90 degree lattice. So this is more like looking like the 60 degree vector pair. So it must have quite some tilt. But for the time being, we don't know this yet. Um, <coughs> and we also told the script to not look for crystal tilt. Somewhere is here this flag to say tilt geometry from lattice, no. Yeah, so we did not look for crystal tilt. Um, but at least it worked. We could have gone for a defocus gradient by using CTF find or GCTF. I stay with CTF find and try this, but now I want to look for the, where's this, the defocus gradient with the yes here. Let's see if this works. So what this would do, do now is it cuts tiles, seven by seven tiles from this image. Each tile is 2000 by 2000 pixels. So the tiles are overlapping because our entire image is only 4K by 4K. Um, <coughs> and then it runs CTF find three on the central tile with great detail. Um, so the central tile will be searched for defocus and astigmatism. And after that, it will run CTF find on the outer tiles, the other three by three and then five by five and then f seven by seven tiles, starting from the central tile and only adjust defocus, not search for astigmatism anymore, so it's faster. Um, and determine a grid of defocus values on seven by seven locations. So here is CTF find running on 31 cores. That's good. We have to wait for this to finish. And then we see the, the panel. Yeah, this takes as long as before. Um, here are parameters that are used for the search range for CTF find. So we search from two micrometer defocus to 50, no, from 200 nanometer to 5 micrometer defocus. That's a long search range and 250 angstroms step size, so this is why it takes so long. So now CTF find has determined for the central tile, which is this one, 
the defocus and is running over all the other tiles. And it has produced lots of ton ring fits, which are all these here. And they all look okay. And the bottom right one here, to me, looks larger in diameter than this one here, but we will see later. So this is on overlapping 2K images um, across the image. See, the find was one on all of them. And there is a marked version of this file. So on all these defocus measurements, um, there's another program that fits a planar plane, a tilted plane across these defocus measurements. And um, the measurements that are outliers from this fit they are crossed out and then the fit is done in iterations iteratively with the remaining uh, positions until there's a good fit to at least half of the numbers of defocus values here um, that is on a plane. And if I now display with T the tilt geometry then we see here that on the right side there is less under focus, bigger ton rings, on the left is more under focus, smaller ton rings, we saw this before. And we have a tilt axis that is, um, should be indicated down here, the tilt angle is 48 degrees, so this looks like strong tilt. And the tilt axis is minus 69 degrees, so which means from the x-axis um, minus 69 um, so usually positive values are counterclockwise mathematically positive and this minus 69 means it's from the x-axis down here this angle minus 69 degrees and that defines the tilt axis and we have a negative tilt angle of minus 48 which means on the upside we have less under focus and at the bottom end we have more under focus that's the definition of a negative tilt angle. So now we have the tilt angle known, which is here. Um, this tilt axis and tilt angle, they are known for the um, for the grid, for the carbon film. And now we can do this lattice search again um, with find lattice. Um, so it will probably find the same lattice as before. It should. This is the same lattice as before, it was the same program. But now the crystal tilt axis, the crystal tilt angle, um, axis and angle can be calculated. And this depends on how the lattice lies on the grid. If the, if the crystal would be in a different orientation on this piece of carbon film, then the crystal tilt axis would be different because this is the tilt axis from the point of view of the crystal. And if the crystal rotates, then it feels that the tilt axis is different. So once its feet are uphill and once its head is uphill, and so if you if you lie on a mountain slope, then you, know, you feel different if you lie in different directions. So the crystal would see a different tilt geometry than the carbon film. And this is reflected in these variables here. Um, okay, the next script would just refine these values in case you would have a different tilt geometry, then the crystal tilt axis would be refined. The next thing is uh, CTF correction, and we do here face flipping in this image um, in stripes, in 21 stripes, before everything else, before unbending. So here we, at the moment, the processing is very hopeful and ambitious, and we try to process this image up to four angstrom resolution. And based on four angstrom resolution and a 48 degree tilt angle, uh, the script here determined that we need 21 stripes across this image. So that within one stripe, uh, 